Hi, my name is Martin Blunden, and this is the second in our series of fire engineering tech talks on the problem of fighting fires in basements and other enclosed spaces. The talks are the production of a collaborative effort between the Scottish branch of the Institution of Fire Engineers, the University of Edinburgh and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. The scientific research that forms the basis of the talks was carried out by the University of Edinburgh, supported by the Fire Service Research and Training Trust. Tech Talk 1 covered the issue of venting a basement or enclosed space. This talk will look at the scenario where it is necessary to enter an enclosed space but it's not possible or desirable to ventilate. And Tech Talk 3 will look at the situations where it's not possible or desirable to either ventilate or enter an enclosed space. Now there's a great deal to cover here so we've divided this talk into two parts. The first part, Tech Talk 2A, will look at the science which underpins entering a compartment on fire. And the second part, Tech Talk 2B, will look at the practicalities of doing so. We saw in Tech Talk 1 that a backdraft or flare up may well occur if an underventilated compartment on fire is ventilated through a single opening. We also know that firefighters are often required to enter such a compartment. And when they do, they typically use the application of water spray directly into the hot upper layer of gases in the compartment to try and extinguish the flames and reduce the likelihood of a flare-up or backdraft. In spraying fine water droplets into the hot upper gas layer, they're using the gas cooling technique to control conditions in the compartment and help them extinguish the fire. However, there is little scientific evidence in the literature to support this technique and experience has shown that gas cooling is not always effective when fighting fires. So to investigate the science and underpin the knowledge behind gas cooling, the University of Edinburgh carried out a series of experiments to try and better understand what happens when water spray is introduced into the smoke layer of a hot fire compartment. The research. The research followed earlier work on fire dynamics in basement fires reported in Tech Talk 1 and should be considered in conjunction with it. This first talk looked at the changing fire dynamics in basements when ventilation conditions changed. If you need to remind yourself about this, you can have another look at the first Tech Talk online at the following address. In this talk, Tech Talk 2A, we want to build on the first one by considering changes in both the temperature and combustibility of the hot upper layer of gas in the compartment when water spray is applied. We will then discuss in Tech Talk 2B how this could inform and improve existing operational guidance. To make a start with understanding the science, a programme of reduced scale fire experiments were undertaken by the University of Edinburgh in order to establish the difference between the effects of the application of constant and then pulsing water on the temperature in the upper layer, as well as considering any effects of compartment size on the relationship between water spray application and temperature drop. As in our first tech talk, a small-scale compartment was constructed to carry out the experiments. The temperatures within the experimental compartment were recorded using three vertical thermocouple trees located at different positions along the compartment, each with four thermocouples at different heights. Polypropylene pellets were used as the fuel and a small amount of N-heptane was used to get the fire going. When a fire burns in a compartment, the smoke produced forms a hot layer which fills the upper part of the compartment. This layer thickens as the fire continues to burn. Below this, a lower layer of cooler air may remain. During the experiments, a spray system was used to inject water into the hot upper layer at a constant pressure through an adjustable brass nozzle. This delivered water in a fine hollow cone spray pattern. Results. The full results of the experiments are available online at the following address. In summary, it was observed that 1. Only water droplets with a diameter less than 0.5 mm evaporate. 2. The total heat absorbed by the water spray is inversely proportional to the droplet diameter 
and directly proportional to the smoke layer thickness the droplets travel through. Three, finely divided water sprays are more effective in extracting heat from the hot layer because reducing the drop size increases the surface area of the water mass and thereby increases the rate of heat transfer. Four, at a local level, the expansion of the water droplets when they're converted to vapor can disrupt the entrainment of air into the burning smoke layer, quenching it temporarily. And if the water spray can dilute the fuel concentration in the burning gas mixture to below the lower flammability limit, the burning may actually stop. 5. At the compartment level, the production of steam from the water spray interaction can significantly dilute the oxygen concentration in the enclosure and may extinguish the fire if the concentration falls below the limiting oxygen concentration. 6. The hot gases that collect in the upper layer of an enclosure are cooled rapidly by the first contact with water mist, typically resulting in an instantaneous volume reduction. 7. Pulsing the water spray appears to lead to greater net evaporation, which reduces the oxygen concentration faster than steady water injection. This improvement is due to the faster depletion rate of oxygen in the compartment. The recurring turbulent mixing created by the pulsing spray enhances this effect. To get maximum benefit, a better mist dispersion has the potential to increase performance and get the maximum benefit from the gas cooling method. So, in practice, 1. The nozzle cone angle should be adjusted to give a water spray jet with as much penetration through the smoke layer as possible to maximize the heat absorption and 2. The water drop should be small enough to maximize evaporation, but big enough to maximize penetration. The hot gases in the upper layer will tend to swirl one way or the other, depending on the shape of the room and the location of the fire. The most effective application of the gas cooling technique directs the water spray against the direction of smoke movement. This improves cooling because this counter motion maximizes the convective heat exchange and promotes further evaporation thus maximizing the total heat extraction from the hot gases. If sufficient heat is extracted, the gas phase temperature of the flame can fall below that necessary to sustain a combustion reaction. This explains the temporary disappearance of the flames in the upper hot layer when spray pulses in the gas cooling technique are correctly applied. Firefighting in practice, cooling the upper gas layer will reduce the heat radiating to firefighters working below it. Also, using short pulses of water spray can provide a safe zone in the immediate vicinity of the firefighting team. This will provide a more efficient barrier against radiation if it is made up of small droplets in a dense spray. Once again, the pulsing nature of the gas cooling technique is more efficient than a continuous spray application. The experiments indicate that with regard to the upper gas layer, for the same volume of water, short pulses of water have a better cooling effect than longer bursts. While the gas cooling technique cools both the upper and lower layers, the cooling effect is greater in the hotter upper layers. The gas cooling technique is largely ineffective with upper layer temperatures below 200 degrees C. With regard to the lower gas layer temperature, where our firefighters are likely to be, it was found that the cooling effect was largely independent of the duration of the burst and there was no apparent benefit to using pulses instead of long bursts. This concludes our look at the science that underpins the practicalities of using the gas cooling technique when entering larger compartment fires. In our next Fire Tech Talk 2B, we will go on to see how an improved understanding of the science can inform the practicalities of doing just that.